And this is the cue. Silicon Angle's continuous production of the MongoDB Day event here in the Big Apple. We are checking in with John Hoffman, who's an engineering infrastructure lead at Foursquare. John, welcome to the Cube. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I'm here with my my co-host Jeff, Jeff Kelly, and uh, cube, Mongo does these things all over the place. Uh, we had Max on earlier today. He was telling us about sort of the the ecosystem, how it's growing. So how's this day going for you? Well, you know, what are you learning here? What what, what attracts you to events like this? Uh, I think the biggest attraction for me is meeting up with other big users of Mongo, and we could talk about you know different challenges that we've had scaling things out. Um, either with Mongo or with other things. But it's really, for me, about meeting the other you know, people who do what I do. Yeah, so is that the big challenge? Is that what keeps you up at night, is figuring out how to scale and, and do so reliably? And um, yeah, a lot more, that kept me up at night a lot more in the past than it does now. Okay, so you solved that problem. Uh, right, I don't know if we solved it, but we're you know, a little huh. bit more stable than we were. Lots of more gnarly problems, is that, yeah? Yeah, yeah, we have other problems like, you know, just. More, our business problems are actually keeping me up at night more than our uh, our scalability problems. So okay, just so, uh, so, so talk a little bit more about your role uh, at Foursquare. Mm -hmm. Sure, I lead the uh, infrastructure team in New York, and we do a few things. One of them is building higher level ser services on top of Mongo itself, mm -hmm. um, and that involves a lot of you know. Um, building tools that other developers can use to interact with Mongo. Um, we're also working on a big project right now to split up our monolithic application server into multiple smaller applications. So we're developing this service-oriented architecture and we're building a lot of the tooling to make that possible. Uh, my team also works on all of the offline processing at Foursquare. So we take all of the data that we have in Mongo, we snapshot it, we pull it into Hadoop, along with other log data, and that allows us to run you know, business analytics, and it allows us to create a lot of the signals that we use to power our recommendation engine offline. So you're an early Mongo user. Talk about, yeah. um, talk about what the motivation was to, to bring in Mongo, um, you know, why Mongo, and, and what, what specifically you're doing with Mongo. Um, sure, so we started using Mongo about three and a half years ago. And um, at the time, we were running uh, on you know, a standard SQL engine, a uh, popular open source uh, version of SQL. And the reason we moved over, there, there, there are actually a bunch of reasons, but one of the major ones was that we knew we were going to have a lot of data. We knew that um, our biggest data source, which at the time was check-ins, was growing at an exponential rate and we would have to split that data up in some way in order to scale. We can no longer keep it on just one server, even if we bought the biggest server out there. Um, so we would have to shard our data. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. You could do that on top of a standard SQL engine by managing uh, the data splits yourself, um, or you could use a tool like Mongo where a lot of that infrastructure and uh, heavy lifting is handled for you. So that was really an attractive proposition for us. Talk a little bit more about that alternative, um, that kind of brute force, uh, kind of, I guess, describe it as load balancing, uh, homegrown load balancing, right? Versus right. what's inherent to Mongo. Can you describe that in a little bit more detail and help, help people understand the inherent nature of that capability? Uh, sure, so you know, let's say you have you know, a data set that has billions of things and you, you need to split them across multiple servers mm -hmm. for one reason or another. Either you, you know, there's not enough uh, space to store them on one server or you know, because the write rate, the rate at which you're writing data you know, is too high for a single server to support. Um, and you could manage that yourself on any sort of storage, uh, using any sort of storage mechanism by, by a few different ways. One way is to just say, okay, I'm going to like pick some unique identifier that lives inside this piece of data and based on some sort of hashing function, decide you know, which of your multiple hardware backends that, that have your storage engine you're going to put the data on. Um, and that works out pretty well, but you have to manage a lot of the complications yourself. Like what happens when one node becomes more unbalanced than another. What happens when, you know, if you start out with two or three nodes, then you have to add a fourth and you want to rebalance your data. There's a lot of uh, accounting work that you have to do there. So 
to make that work well. So a lot of manual intervention to rebalance Yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of manual tooling that you have to do. A lot of people have done that successfully, but if you haven't done it before, um, it's a real challenge. Well, it's hard to make that scale, right? I mean, at, at, at mega scale, yeah, I mean, you could make it scale, it's just that there's a lot of you know, work and expertise involved to get it to work correctly. Yeah, I guess what I mean is the business model doesn't scale well, I mean, because you just got to throw, keep throwing people at the problem. Right, right exactly, so you know, you're- People with you're, specific skill sets, sorry. Exactly, so you know, maybe you have to waste a, an engineer's time for a year to get this to work right. And, and you're suggesting, or I'm inferring from what you said then, that Mongo somehow magically helps you deal with that and can make it easier to automate that, that capability. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Mongo has a built-in feature called uh, auto balancing and auto sharding, and you know what you do is you know for your your type of data, you could say, okay, this is the key that I want to split things up on, and it will handle distributing it across multiple nodes. When you add a new node to your cluster, it will automatically rebalance the data for you. It will continue to keep things in balance as you know things become unbalanced as your application grows. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about as well kind of the business side of the equation. Obviously we hear a lot about in this, you know, with the, the big data meme about turning mm -hmm. data into kind of monetizing your data and that's kind of the, the goal right. for a lot of companies. And obviously that's what Foursquare does. You're a data driven business really. Right. It's all yeah. about data. So um, explain how Mongo helps you do that. Specifically, what, what, what was it in Mongo versus something like Cassandra or some other mm -hmm. databases you could have uh, could be using. What about Mongo specifically really allows you that flexibility or whatever the, the characteristics are to really leverage the data to, to drive services that really drive revenue, drive your business? Um, I think one of the biggest attractions of Mongo with regards to flexibility is the, the ability to move quick, quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and we could do that in a few ways. So one is that the data model doesn't need to be specified in advance. Um, so you know, one of the features of Mongo they hear about is that it's schemaless. Um, which means basically that you have to enforce the schema somewhere else in your stack, probably in your application, but it allows you to, to modify the structure of your data on the fly without having to do an expensive migration that mm -hmm. um, might take a really long time to accomplish in other storage engines. Another piece of flexibility is that we can add secondary indexes very easily, mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's very challenging if you're using a product that's more of a key value store. Um, the problem is if you have a piece of data and you want to, you know, not only look it up by some primary key, but by some other, you know, other aspect of the data, um, what you often have to do is manage all of these lookup tables for yourself, and managing all these things, keeping them in sync, can slow down development. Because Mongo allows all these secondary indexes, we can move very quickly, we could look up the same type of data in a lot of different ways, and that allows us to move quickly. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you're on the infrastructure side, but in mm -hmm. terms of developing and deploying new applications on top of Mongo, it sounds like that, that's really one of the keys, especially mm -hmm. for, for a business such as Foursquare, which is you know, very much a mobile application. They've got to, got to move quickly in terms of uh, the way the users expect to interact with, with an app and, and staying kind of current with uh, new ways of, serv of providing services to clients, to customers. Right, exactly. Like Foursquare isn't a static application. Right. We're, we're never done with it, right? We're constantly <laughs> yep. adding new features, tweaking things, um, and we want to be able to do that on top of the infrastructure that we've already created. We don't want to have to spend, you know, uh, a long time re-engineering the, the data, creating entirely new uh, data sets just to look up the data that we already have. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned, so you also use Hadoop kind of for the, for, to kind of analyze mm -hmm. the user experience, I would imagine, the, the data that's coming from the applications, how, how people are using Foursquare. Right. Is that how, is that kind of the use case? And Because uh, I'm interested in kind of understanding uh, Mongo over on side by side with Hadoop and how they complement one another. Yeah, so uh, we use Mongo for all of the online, um, all of the online data in the mm -hmm. application. Um, but we do a lot of things offline, like we just want to see how many users did some action yesterday or in the past week. Uh, how is this tweak to the product, um, how has that affected usage? And we do all of that analysis offline, um, and it, it just, you know, Mongo wasn't exactly the right fit for us. It might be now they're adding a lot of aggregation features which are like really attractive, but they're really new. Um, and we've had this problem for a, a long time. So what we do is we store all of that data in Hadoop so that we could analyze it offline. And you know, it, I, I think it's probably not a good idea to use the same infrastructure that you use for online processing for offline queries because we want to be able to do tremendously complicated things and not have it impact 
you know, our online service. Mm -hmm. So kind of keep those separate. Well, that's yeah. interesting you say that because we're seeing, in, you know, in, uh, there is some talk about the, the kind of the world's emerging, kind of the transactional with your analytic capabilities. Yeah. Specifically, if you want to do real time, really kind of analyze that data in real time as it's coming from, whether it's an application or, or whatever source right. system, uh, make a quick decision on what that means and then turn that back around to an action to impact the transactional yeah. system. Uh, is that something, do you, you don't think that, do you think that, that architecture, that concept is, just difficult to deploy. I mean, what, is your, what are your thoughts? I think you could do that. You just have to have like a you know a hard boundary between the two systems and keep them isolated. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as you're not using the same resources okay. to to do that analysis, then you're fine. So th there's a lot of different ways of achieving that. You know, you could stream all of your online data, all of your online data to two different places, and mm -hmm. as long as you're able to keep them isolated, that could be fine. Um, that's not what we do. We do more batch processing. Right. Um, because we just like we don't need the answers like at you know right at the minute we could wait a day, um, but if you do then you know as long as you keep things isolated that could work. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So I wonder if we could talk about your your infrastructure like a lot of you know companies when you were starting up mm -hmm. you know use the public cloud like you use right. AWS um, and and I believe you've begun to move or have moved back into an in-house infrastructure maybe it's a combination mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk about that sure. a little bit and the decisions to do that. Yeah, so when we first started, we were um, hosted on AWS. And um, I think you know AWS and other cloud hosting services are definitely the way to go if you're just starting a new company and you're not sure how you're going to grow, you're not sure exactly what sort of resources you're going to need because you can just be extremely flexible and move really quickly. If you need to spin up 10 machines, you, know, you just start them up with an API call. It's super simple. Um, but once you start to, to get a little bit more stable, you understand how you're growing, you understand exactly what hardware you need, then you kind of have to reevaluate things from both a, a cost perspective and perhaps you know a stability, reliability perspective. Um, and we started doing that a couple of, I guess maybe a year and a half ago. Um, and we only did this because we already had some in-house expertise on how to go about managing your own hardware infrastructure. And uh, what we did was we started looking at the costs and weighing that against you know, the, the trade-offs and flexibility, and we decided that it made sense for us to move at least some of our uh, infrastructure from the AWS cloud onto our own hardware. The pieces that were more predictable, perhaps, Yeah, right? the, p the pieces that were more predictable. And it turns out that some of the pieces that are more predictable are the database itself, you know, because you know, you can't really like, you don't scale a database overnight. It's something that kind of grows slowly over time. So we could predict how much hardware we're going to need a few months out and purchase that in advance. Yeah, so you found like a lot of companies that renting is more expensive than owning for certain applications. Yeah, definitely for certain things. And it, it also, it depends on what sort of expertise you have in house. If you've never done this before, if you've never managed your own hardware, if you're like a five person startup, I definitely wouldn't recommend this. You know, it's kind of like what percentage of your overall like technology budget is going to be devoted to the, the people required to get this yeah. to work. Be careful what you wish for in that regard. Um, talk about what you would advise young people looking to get into this business, looking to get into this new world of development and big data and mm -hmm. NoSQL and what, what do you advise these young people? Yeah, so I think like for people who just want to learn the new technologies out there, um, I always tell people to figure out like a problem that you want to solve and just solve it using that technology. So it's very hard to like read a book and go through tutorials of all these contrived problems that you don't really care about. It's much more interesting to find something that you really passionately want to do and you know pick that new technology that you want to learn about um, to do it in. I think that's the best way to learn new things. If you're interested in like working for a company, uh, a startup company like Foursquare or others out there, um, I mean, we're, we're all hiring, so, so come talk to us, please. Who, what, what kind of person are you looking for? Or people? Um, we're looking for you know, just any engineer. Um, we're just looking for really smart people um, who are passionate about development, you don't necessarily have to have prior experience with the technologies that we're using because you know they're 
I think you know the, we're using Scala and we're using Mongo, and these are kind of have smaller user bases to compare to the things that are out there. But we're looking for people who can just learn quickly and are interested in these things. Excellent. All right, John, well thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate your perspectives. It was uh, good to have you. Sure, great to be here, thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Jeff Kelly and I will be back. This is theCUBE, we're live uh, from the Marriott Marquis. This is the MongoDB days. We'll be right back.